Whitey Bulger's life of crime captivated our imaginations, elevating the mobster to mythic status. During his 16 years on the run, many wrote off his capture, assuming he'd never answer for his myriad misdeeds. But for all his mystique, Bulger is also the source of profound suffering. Today, at his sentencing hearing, Bulger's victims jumped at the chance to describe the ways he hurt them. And while many find it cathartic, victim impact statements hold little sway in the judicial process. WGBH news reporter Gail Huff has more. Steve Davis repeated for the media what he finally got a chance to say to James Whitey Bulger in court today. I said if I could, I'd strangle him with my bare hands the way he did my sister. Even though Bulger was not convicted in the death of his sister, Deborah, Davis and the rest of the 19 families involved in the racketeering trial were given a chance to address the court with victim impact statements today. I wanted to give my husband a personality. That was my whole objective. And it seems like that's what I've done. The fact that he didn't turn around, he didn't look at anyone. I wasn't surprised. Um, I do think he's a coward. I don't think he can face his accusers. It did feel good to describe him for what he is, a uh, bag of jailhouse rags waiting to be placed on uh, cold steel. And I hope he enjoys every day of his retirement there. Since the mid-1980s, providing victim impact statements has become common practice. Usually it's the only chance the victim or victim's family has to face the defendant. 18-year-old Lauren Astley's mother, Mary Dunn, addressed her daughter's murderer, Nate Fujita, last year in court. The graduate of Wayland High was strangled and stabbed shortly after their breakup. I will never have the pleasure of the milestones of college graduation, special birthdays, a wedding, or grandchildren. In 2009, David Cates was away on business when four young men broke into his Mount Vernon, New Hampshire home, killing his wife and nearly killing his daughter. It is not known what future impact this event will have on Jamie's life. She has had to witness more evil in this world than any human being should ever be made to bear. If the victim is alive, he or she can face the defendant. Going public, Faith Johnston read a heartbreaking victim impact statement talking about attempting suicide after being raped by a priest. Her statement may have helped the judge, who sentenced Reverend Calvin Igubita to 12 to 14 years in prison. For WGBH News, I'm Gail Hoff. My first guest is an expert in criminal procedure. Robert Bloom is a professor at Boston College Law School. Welcome, morning. Morning, professor. Yeah. So do they, they don't really take these into consideration. Don't they have to follow a certain you know, uh, structure yes, of the law first? Yes, but notwithstanding that, it's, it's a tremendous cathartic uh, relief for many of the victims. Um, what was interesting about this case is that some of the victims um, were not, uh, the jury didn't actually find um, um, guilt of Mr. Bulger right. uh, with regard to some of the victims. And that's, that was somewhat unusual about this case. And the judge, in her discretion, let all the victims, all the uh, possible uh, family members of uh, the various mm -hmm. murder victims speak. And but that the, was somewhat unusual. The jury does not get to hear this. The jury, it's, it's, it's now up to the discretion of the judge in terms of what the sentence will be. And she's limited by what he was convicted of and sentencing guidelines to some extent. Would it be totally bizarre and in, inappropriate at the end of a trial to let the victim speak? Well, it's, it's, it's not bizarre because it is cathartic. No, I mean uh, with the jury there. Um, that sometimes um, occurs possibly with a uh, capital case, mm. but generally n not because it's the judge who does most of the sentencing in our criminal justice system. All right, I want to bring uh, another voice in on this. Liam Lowney is the executive director of the Massachusetts Office of Victim Assistance. Now, Liam, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I vaguely remember when this whole thing got going, that like maybe in the early 80s or maybe in the 70s, I, mean, I think it was the 80s, because there was a sense here in Massachusetts that victims didn't have any rights in the courtroom. And while other states, almost every state has some version of in victim impact statement. We at that time didn't. Um, you're actually right. Um, as a matter of fact, next year is the 30th anniversary oh, of victim rights in Massachusetts. Been a while. So, <laughs> uh, so, so you're, you're right on with that. Um, and victim impact statements are one piece of that. Um, the three main ideas is that victims have a right to, to information, they have a right to be present, and they have a right to be heard. Um, 
And I disagree with the notion that victim impact statements don't have any sway. Um, I think they do have sway um, and do impact not only the court who had, has heard the case in sentencing, um, as we're talking about here, um, but it is really the, the one opportunity that a crime victim has to define and talk about who the person was that was victimized. A trial is not mm -hmm. set up around the victim, it's set up around the offender. But oftentimes a judge comes with the sentence the same day that the victim impact statements are read. I mean, that is more often the case than not. It didn't happen today, but isn't that right, Professor? That yeah, they've already right. got the sentence, and so they've got the victim speak, and then they deliver it. That, that's accurate. Um, I, I agree with uh, uh, my, uh, yeah. my Mr. Liam. Uh, because for many years, victims were ignored. They were like yeah. Victorian children. They were seen but not heard. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important uh, to recognize that victims are part of the system. And the victim rights movement has provided counseling for victims. They've made sure that they can attend the court proceedings. Uh, they can be heard by the court. Um, um, they, they're provided sometimes with separate rooms so that they can sit in. So it's an important mm -hmm. part of our system. But the effect on sentencing, I would suggest, is minimal, if, if, if it exists at all. Yeah. But I would say that the victim rights movement that we're referring to comes out of the voices of survivors. Yeah. And judges hearing from the voices of survivors. The judge hears that voice, but so does everyone else in the mm -hmm. courtroom. Well, um, except for in a federal trial, and I was going to make this case that we didn't get to hear any of this, which is you know, aggravating in, in and of itself. We didn't get to hear anybody testify. We didn't get to hear the victims. But in a state case, we would have. And, and we should also point out that under state provisions, there's also a victim's assistance fund that almost any victim of a crime qualifies for, isn't that right? There is. A, there's a compensation, a victim compensation assistance fund. Uh, that's one of the rights that falls within the victim rights statute. I don't think they have the same equivalency on the federal side. Well, well there, there's some restitution in this case because they did find considerable amounts yeah. of money uh, with Mr. Bulger. And, and, and my guess is that the folks who are allowed to speak today there were, the, the, the jury found 11 of, uh, yeah. ni uh, 11 of 19 of the murders mm -hmm. that were actually guilty. I think only those 11 would be entitled to that Actually, I think they, should, they decided that they were going to give it to all of them. I think I heard that uh, this week, that they okay. were going to give it to all of them. But not to parse this thing here, but that was Whitey Bollinger's money. It wasn't the federal government's money. That's so right. it's not like the government is reaching into some coffer like Massachusetts has mm -hmm. to uh, make a distribution. Well, I would, I would just build on that to say that the actually the Victim Compensation Assistance Fund is different than restitution. A significant part of the money actually comes from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And victims in the federal court system and the state court system have a right to apply for it through the states. So the money and funding comes from so the federal government. Can. Yes. Everybody can. Whether you're Absolutely. a federal case or a state yes. case. Yes. Correct. And that's good. Do, do, yeah. do people know that? Do they do it? They do. I mean, we're <laughs> continually trying to do outreach in China, and this is a great opportunity to yeah. let people know about um, that those funds exist. Um, they're very specific, um, but certainly they can hmm. call the Mass Office for Victims right. Assistance. Liam Maloney, Robert Bloom, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Coming.